Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Performance Art Daily for today. I'm Jessica Weinman. I will be moderating this conversation. Um, and I'd like to let you know that uh, you're welcome to carry on eating and getting more food, if you like, during the conversation and to be comfortable and mobile and not feel too kind of locked into an audience seat or, or role. We are really very much hoping that there will be lots of conversation that comes from a dialogue between the artists who are up here and those of you who are there, um, artists and otherwise. So uh, feel free to, uh, to intervene and hopefully it won't take much coercion for that, for that to happen. Um, this performance art daily, as all of them, uh, is also being recorded and will be posted online. Uh, I don't know exactly when, but, but later. I know this happens fairly, fairly quickly. So if there's anything you want to revisit for, I don't know, some reason, <laughs> you'll have that opportunity to. But uh, most importantly, I would like to introduce the artists on the panel today, Carl Bouchard and Martin Dufresne, who performed yesterday evening in this very space, actually. And Camille Turner, who's farthest away from me over there, whose performance will take place on Sunday afternoon, 2.30, Camille? 2.30 on Sunday at Butterfield Park, um, just behind OCAD University. Um, and uh, hopefully you'll be able to hear more about these happened and forthcoming performances, still as part of the conversation. Um, and I want to let you know that we've been kind of assigned, as it were, the, the topic of theatricality for today's conversation. And um, we have not prepared papers on theatricality, which I hope is a huge relief to all of you. <laughs> certainly, certainly was to me and, uh, and to the artists as well. So I just wanted to open with some brief thoughts on that. Um, and I, I promise they're not highfalutin academic -y <laughs> thoughts or anything. Um, just as a way maybe of getting us getting us started or, or moving. Um, one of the things that I was thinking about on the, the topic of theatricality or the word of theatricality is the way that theater and performance art are very often staged as some kind of opposition to one another. And this is a very interesting thing. Performance art is obviously something in which all of us are invested to some degree and yet seems to be a thing that still doesn't have a nice tidy definition. And actually, that's one of the things I particularly love about it. So I'm not at all interested in trying to come up with that today, except that I think we all have different commitments to forms of practice and forms of art and what those things mean. But one of the things that continues to happen, for better or worse, is that uh, lots of folks, artists, academics, everyone, sets up a bit of an opposition between theater and performance art. People say that one of the things that you know, makes performance art performance art is that it's, it's not theater. Um, it doesn't necessarily, although it may happen on a stage in front of an audience, it may, although it also may not, have kind of characters or roles that are driven. It may or may not function with relation to a particular kind of spectacle or the spectacular, right? And of course, not all theater is hugely spectacular either. But in thinking about those as, as dichotomies, one or the other, you know, the spectacle versus non-spectacle, theatrical versus whatever the other end of that would be, whether that would be natural, right, as an opposition to theatrical, possibly. Um, I was thinking most fully about a relationship to audience and what it means in the context of performance art to imagine or, or to talk with artists about how they see themselves conceiving of their work with a space for audience, because it's sometimes very participatory, and Camille, your piece on Sunday, I know, is meant to be a walk with people. So there's not going to be a sharp distinction between your role and that of your audience. And Carl and Martin, last night you functioned kind of in front of audience, but also moved through them and engaged both whisperers of your lines and translators of your lines, too. So the audience some of the audience members became very central, really operative to, to how those works function. So with that kind of rambling preamble, <laughs> I'm really good at those. <laughs> my, best, my best mode, the rambling preamble. Um, then maybe the, the question of audience, some of the things of audience is something that I can 
I can ask you about how you imagine space for audience in your work, whether you're interested in having a, or at various times, because this isn't always consistent perhaps, um, a space between yourself and the audience, or a way of developing some kind of relationship with the people who see and maybe participate in, in your work. Anyone? <laughs> Um, it's interesting because in a lot of ways I feel like I'm the audience, you know? Um, I, don't, I don't really conceive of uh, performance as being, you know, I'm the performer. I'm the one who's performing and there's an audience. So um, we're, we're all entering into this thing together and it's about the relationship for me. It's, my, it's the relationship between people, and I'm one of the people. I just happen to be facilitating that experience. So, um, and, and yeah, and, and you know, Jessica was talking about performance art and the, the lack of definitions and the lack of, you know, so, so where, where are the edges of that? I have another piece that I did. It's it's um, it's a sonic walk as well, but it's it's um, recorded, so it's a recorded piece. But to me, it's a performance as well because um, when you put on your headphones and you download this MP3 file and you go out into where this this piece takes place, you're the performer. You you put this on and, and you're out there. It doesn't need me anymore. My body is not a part of this anymore. It's it's on a you know it's it exists autonomously, and performers come into this world and and perform this piece all the time. So, um, so in terms of performance, I see this as as a re more of a relationship between people, and there there may or there I mean there's always a facilitator, yes. Um, in, in my work anyways, I always facilitate it, but I, I don't have to be even physically present to facilitate it. So that's, um, that's how I'm thinking about performance. I think that in our case, we, for that uh, project, we had to be part of the material of this uh, puppet show. and. Uh, I think I could talk for both of us about uh, disciplines, knowing if it's theater or performance. Uh, I think that when we work together, we doesn't matter for us to know it's to, if it's photographic document of uh, performance or performance for a photo. Uh, and. Our relationship is one of the topic since '98, and uh, we have the, this idea of uh, doing a puppet show since, in, uh, but involving the public to make it more complex and to uh, make the the words, the the text, not only ours, but. Uh, something very uh, archetypal and to with the game of translation and the prompters to have uh, lost and uh, supplement uh, that we couldn't uh, organize or uh, I like the idea that you raise of complexity, mm -hmm. using the audience to add to add a layer of complexity to the to the work. And I'm wondering, you know, and I think that's probably the case with your work, also, Camille. That there is another layer that you really come to rely on the audience to provide for you. So how do you think? Um, well, to the extent that you do, of course. Now I'm asking you about it, even if you haven't thought of it before. But how, you know, or to what extent do you come to depend on audience to, 
to make a kind of layering or complexity visible in your work? Or what does that do for you that you think might not happen in the lab? <coughs> Je vais regarder une petite minute. Est-ce que c'est possible qu'on traduise les questions pour que... Oui. My French is okay, but I don't think it's good enough to give you a full translation. A proper translation. Est-ce que tu... So, uh, à quel point, uh, yeah, le fait d'impliquer les gens dans la performance et dans la possibilité de changer la chose? Yeah, Comment c'est participé? Mm -hmm. Est-ce que je peux répondre? Ben oui. Mais je vais te Non, c'est parce que j'aurais besoin aussi qu'on traduise toute ma réponse. Oui. S'il vous plaît. C'est que dans le travail de performance avec Martin, les spectateurs, on essaie de leur donner différents rôles à différentes occasions de faire déplacer de spectateur des fois à témoin, de, de passer de spectateur à témoin, ou parfois de spectateur à complice d'une scène, ou dans d'autres occasions, même entre spectateur et paparazzi. Arrête là. <rire> so we play with the uh, volunteers and participants to be witness, complices, or paparazzi. So each time the project is involving in different way people. And something, uh, uh, sometimes we are very control freaks, and sometimes we don't, I think we don't. It's open. Donc hier, les spectateurs, en demandant leur collaboration, c'était euh, les porteurs du message <coughs> qui... Mm -hmm. Il jouait un rôle, puis les spectateurs se retrouvaient à ce moment-là plus peut-être témoins hier plutôt que spectateurs d'une scène. Pour 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 Carl, yesterday people, the volunteers were more witnesses, but I could say material, the 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 voices, the emotion of each people, and the way they. Whispers, or it's the real material of that moment. And they, they had a, an active role too, because there was interpret at some point. Yeah. When people had to translate what uh, Martin or Charles said. And it's, it's interesting because it's all about the questions about the. Sorry, yeah. I'm just going to ask because we're taping this. Uh, <laughs> I'm completely unaudible on that. So, yeah, uh, considering the theatrical theme of your question, so that Carl and, uh, and, uh, and Martin use the theatrical elements to uh, like the, the whisper and then the, the, the interpret, I, I think it, it has many levels there. Mm -hmm. I believe it is the, uh, in the subject of the theatrical position. Mm -hmm. Without being that, the theater itself. So that's right into your question. Well, since you've got the microphone and they're out there, <laughs> let me let me turn to you, and then of course we'll come back. We'll carry on with, with the panel as well. I know that um, some of you in the audience today uh, saw that performance last night as well, and I'm wondering if anybody wanted to share a response to that level of participation and whether kind of the visibility of those other participants shifted for you, perhaps from when. They were first called upon to kind of perform or be your accomplices in that performance to, you know, maybe kind of naturalizing their roles as part of the performance. Did anyone have any thoughts or responses to that? I certainly saw when, uh, when volunteers were being requested that those who were fluent in French were kind of being prodded by their neighbors or friends and encouraged. <laughs> and there was a, of course, measure of, um, shyness and reticence at the same time as there was you know, a willingness and desire to, to help out too, or whether any of you, because you were one of the translators last night as well, wanted to make any comment, please. Um, I was kind of, is this on? Or, hello? Yes. Okay. Um, I was curious why you had whisperers, I guess, is part of it? Why? Yeah. 
I mean, because it was also, we I didn't knew that the, the sentences <laughs> we had people okay. to say the, uh, what to say, what to say out loud. I so. this really interesting layer because there were there were two. Mm -hmm. There were the whisperers and also the translators. So it you know it was amplified from a two person performance into a six person performance. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I should say also we had backups or plants just in case. <laughs> but they didn't get there in time. Right. Because okay. you know we didn't know how long it would take whether it would be right. there and whether there'd be people who would feel comfortable speaking. Yeah. So uh, that was a sort of interesting element of like, well, they held back to see if someone else from the audience wanted to have the experience, and it was very nice that it was more spontaneous. Yeah. Actually, that <coughs> moment when <coughs> you got the translators participating in the uh, performance, it became really a performance and <coughs> lost uh, the theatricality, <coughs> perhaps. Because that's uh, the, uh, the most important question, that <coughs> up until then it's a theater, and then it becomes a performance, because theater today <coughs> tries to become performance, and performance turns into theater, mm -hmm. kind of, <coughs> and somewhere they meet. Mm -hmm. And so this piece actually uh, really well presented that. Uh, I think it asks the question of whom performs better. Right. Whom, uh, not only the uh, quality of the voice, but the, also the intention mm -hmm. of sharing the message. So I guess a few times or sometimes the translator was very more con um, convincing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and sometime not, and well, so that's the game uh, of it. And also the, for the whisper, the, the, it was uh, another way to maybe have a lost. If I do, doesn't hear well, I will just re, uh, re say again what I've heard. Maybe it's not the same thing on the paper. So it was. One, well, you know, because there are these multiple layers of participation too, the lines, even if they're not the ones you had written, end up being said three times. So I think there's something about that repetition that sticks with audience in another way too. You mm -hmm. know, one line heard once can disappear very quickly. And there was, I think, an, an anticipation of the whisperer and then of your speech and then of the, the translator as well. So these kind of echoes that were built into it, I think, became very effective in communicating the questions of relationship that and you were dealing with. And for the people who understand both languages, the, uh, the way uh, it's translated, uh, I wouldn't choose that words to say that. Right. This is, so also the, part, the, other, the audience are also par participants in that way of, uh, thinking of the, of the way it's done. Ça parle sur l'expression le, hier de, des, des phrases qu'on qu disait. Mm -hmm. J'aimerais peut-être ajouter quelque chose euh, que le texte, euh, chacune des phrases, on ne peut pas arriver à les dire avec euh, conviction, puisque ça exprime un malaise, même de mal les exprimer. Euh, de bien les exprimer ou de mal les exprimer, ça, ça dissimule toujours un drame plus profond, celui de vouloir changer l'autre. Il n'y avait, avait pas de bonne manière pour nommer la, la déception de l'autre ou la, la rancœur qui s'installe dans une dynamique. So he says that it's uh, almost impossible to, to say those sentences in a good way because there's the emotion behind it, it's too strong or too big to be uh, canalized by words. 
and it always fails. Uh, the language fails to. Well, I think this is certainly the the substance of almost all conversations about relationships too. Mm -hmm. okay, the failure of language to really fully communicate anything that we want to say. And I, mm -hmm. you know, I would suggest that maybe this is not only where we're always grasping for language to communicate intense emotion or change, but it's why we almost all of us at various points feel that we need to say the same kind of thing in multiple different ways one time after the other because the nuance shifts and each layer adds another one to the to the intention. Mm -hmm. And Camille, do you want to maybe um, jump in to talk a little bit about how you use language within your work as well, especially within the sonic walks or <coughs> in any of those constructions. There's, of course, a relationship with audience, but something that you are staging. I mean, you talked about using audience, um, you know, facilitating experience, but there's also a kind of shaping or constructing experience that happens yeah. there too. Okay, so the, the language piece, that's, that's interesting because this piece that I'm going to be doing is, is, it is about language, but it's about, um, <laughs> sort of uh, the poetic language of, of listening and, and attention. Um, so it's, 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 about, um, it's about silence as, as much as it is about sound. So, um, and this is a new direction for me. It, it sort of came about um, because I started doing, um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with my piece, Miss Canadiana, which, which is something I've been doing for a long, long time. So I started um, sort of realizing there's a, a limit to what I could do as Miss Canadiana. I, I, I became very interested in the black histories of, of um, the country. And so I started doing all this research on, on these histories, and I wanted to make them visible. They're all around us, but they're invisible right now. So I wanted to make them visible. So I used Miss Canadiana as a way to, to start to, to make that visible. So she simply told the stories. So, so, um, so that's how it all started. Um, and then I removed her from the stories and I created a piece that is about the stories themselves and puts the, the viewer or the participant at the center of the story. So that's, that's a whole other piece. But in doing that and creating that, I started really honing in on uh, sound, the sounds that are all around us, the things that we just don't even um, pay attention to, the things that, the, 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 the environment, it's like a fish doesn't know it's in water. You know, we don't, we don't really, um, we're not really attuned to the things around us. And so, by, because I was, Creating that work, I started attuning to this environment, and so I wanted the audience, audience, <laughs> to to have that experience as well. But um, yeah, so so it, so this piece is so much about uh, language, but it's about letting go of language and going deeper into all these experiences that we can't talk about with language, that we have to experience. So it's, it's about facilitating experience. Um, I wanted to go back to, to, to Ms. Canadiana, though, just to, to talk about a little bit the uh, idea of audience and, and that role. Because I think um, it, it's interesting when a lot of times when I'm performing as Ms. Canadiana, I have a camera crew. But I don't really want them to shoot me. This piece for me is about the audience. So it's about the responses. It's about that relationship. It's about what's going on. You know? So where the camera is to me is an interesting part of you know, what constitutes audience and what constitutes that. Um, I mean, this piece really um, could not exist without the audience. In, in, in when it's performed live, right? It's all about that response. If I walk down the street as Miss Canadiana and no one noticed, I suppose that's another piece, but. <laughs> I think people would notice. <laughs> <laughs> but it's about, it's about the response, it's about the relationship, right? So, 
Um, and, and, and yeah, and, and, and like your work, um, there's a lot of different roles that audience um, and, and participants um, have in the, in the work. And, and sometimes there aren't people just on the street. Sometimes they're part of it. But, but, but people sort of get it on different levels. There's so many different layers of interpretation going on, you know? So it's, it's kind of an interesting piece that I'm always learning from as I go along. And it always changes depending on, you know, who's around and, and what happens. And I never know what's going to happen. I never predict what is going to happen. It's, it's always a surprise. <laughs> well, I love these exercises in being forced to let go, right? I mean, we can't program other people's responses, exactly. no matter what, you know, no matter how staged, right, or controlled we try to make something. We can't program, we can't anticipate not only what our responses will be to how well or not well we feel we've done in any particular moment or what a resonance was with audience or environment, but what people will, will take away from it. Um, and yet one of the things you've raised that I think is really useful to all of this is the way in which you know, all of these performances really uh, function to call attention to something, right? So um, I don't want to say that that's theatrical per se, but I think you have quite different modes in, in those works anyhow of, of calling attention. I mean, Miss Canadiana is pretty spectacular even without the camera crew, right? So yes, people would know, you've got a sash and tiara for Pizze, right? But um, <laughs> and depending on what neighborhood you're walking in, that could be just part of what happens every day. <laughs> Who knows, maybe people are used to it. <laughs> but you know, the camera crew does something, right? Because what it does in, in your in your conception anyway, is function to call attention to this other thing. And as you said, if, it, if there wasn't an audience, in a sense, there wouldn't be anything to perform. And you know, what you were doing through the kind of structure you, you created was really calling attention, not just to conversation about relationship, you know, which in society today, where people imagine themselves as very emotive, mm -hmm. people are witness to conversations about relationship. But this um, kind of very difficult dialogue about, you know, you do this and you don't do that, and I do it, and I, you never change, and I will change, and all of these sorts of things, this dynamic, you know, is, is called attention to not only because you're separated from audience, right, you're in front of the audience in that way, but you've constructed an entire apparatus that, that shapes that mm -hmm. conversation, that calls attention to, you know, these intimate conversations in, in another way altogether. So I think, you know, maybe in talking about how we facilitate or construct experience and how we share something with audience, it's really about how we use, how you use a variety of means to call attention to things. Maybe not always um, the thing that you think is most important or what audience thinks is most important, right? Because, you know, if, this has something to do with props as well. I mean, in the Miss Canadiana context, you're you know, fully got up as Miss Canadiana. So that marks, that calls attention to a certain kind of difference, right? From you know, the genes of every day, right? The gown and the tiara. Mm -hmm. And in your case, you had a whole apparatus. You, know? yeah. you were connected together. You were tied, literally locked, locked into together, this mechanism. Yeah together, but dressed the same, you know, holding the same kind of apparatus with the, the head. So I guess I'm wondering how, I don't know, what's my question? What's my takeaway from all this? Um, you know, how, how you see those, those trappings, those things you use, whether they're costumes or staging devices to, you know, to help construct some kind of experience or relationship. You know, for yourself or with the audience. Les accessoires, les objets, les 
<laughs> just <laughs> just to say the, the part, the mirror part of the cobble we used yesterday, we used it also in another uh, performance. <laughs> Uh, it's uh, the best way to feel linked to someone and to feel I his pro posture. And every every time Cal is moving, I have to. to uh, it's like being in the same body. Right. So it's uh, and to change it as a small theater puppet theater was uh, to put something uh, difficult or a kind of uh, torture object to uh, cute, uh, cute theater, but uh, like a uh, relation could look cute and a couple could look cute, but it could be also awful right. and very terrible. So. Um. Look, we, uh, just to say, we are not a couple, <laughs> we are a couple. <laughs> we were, we still... He dit toujours ça. <laughs> <laughs> we, we've been partners, lovers, but for very few uh, months, long time ago, but we are still a couple in art. Moi je dis c'est moi, Martin dit toi. <laughs> <laughs> This okay. is for the bio part. J'ai une chose à dire sur les objets. Le le jug autour du cou, ça oblige à être très attentif à l'autre, d'être de de le protéger parce que les mouvements sont relativement difficiles. Et s'il y avait une chute, ce serait même dangereux pour se casser le cou. En apparence. Il y a une présence d'apparence, qui est aussi euh, un potentiel dangereux où on doit faire attention et très sensible à l'autre, puis à, à l'environnement, euh, à l'espace. Trébucher, ce serait très dangereux de tomber avec ça, euh, qui est en bois, là, puis très, euh, très épais. So it gives to each the responsibility to care for the other one because it could be painful or dangerous for the other. Yeah, but also you're saying it's very, you become very uh, sensitive or attentive to the movements of the other person the other. because you're so locked together. But it literally could break your neck if you yeah. if you fall. He's saying so. There's another kind of level, you know, where on, on the one hand there's a, a, a proximity, which is very important, but also a kind of um, embodiment. Real, yeah, yeah. Of the other. Yeah. Just une dernière chose, J'ai perdu ton français. Maybe it's easy to say it in English. <laughs> euh, dans nos performances, il y a, ou même dans nos photographies, il y a toujours des jeux de compétition ou de rivalité, mais toujours en même temps, ça oblige à considérer une grande complicité et une, une attention à l'autre. Toujours à la un amour qui est sous-jacent, même si ce qui est euh, exposé, les jeux euh, performatifs, sont soit des jeux de rivalité ou de compétition, mais ça oblige à réfléchir une grande attention, un, un, un amour en dessous de ça. Yeah. So there's a, a rivalry and a competition within, within this, but there's also um, a complicity between the two um, performers. So at the same time, is it really... Um, requires and the discussion around relationship depends on this kind of rivalry. Um, it continues to solicit a kind of um, sympathy within the structure of the relationship because those roles are mutually dependent. They're so heavily connected together. Donc les objets Merci. Merci. <laughs> <laughs> Donc les objets contribuent d'une manière ou d'une autre à créer des jeux d'ambivalence nous servent à le mieux possible exprimer ce ça. So there's an, a role of ambivalence that's also very uh, kind of important but difficult to express within within that as well. I would not have been good enough last night. No. Tu comprends? Menteuse. 
<laughs> but but this ambivalence is very important, right, within yeah. the relationship and also within the communication of, of that that work. I mean, I think that um, function of ambivalence is really useful, <laughs> right? I think that's one of the useful things you can calling attention that we, you know, we don't overly or you know you don't in your work. I say we like I make you know, work, which I don't. <laughs> um, but, you know, we can't overly determine the outcomes, I think. You know, I, so my, my sense is that um, this kind of ambivalence is very productive in the same way that some of the discomfort, maybe, that's provoked by these actions or these apparati, the structures, can also be uncomfortable, but, but productive, right? They, they elicit response somehow, which is what they're intended to do, no matter what that response is. I mean, have um, any of you come face to face with responses from people that were so far away from what you expected that it really surprised you or gave you other things to think about in the construction of your work? Est-ce que ça t'arrive d'être confronté ou surpris par une réaction qui est vraiment à des kilomètres de ce que tu attendais d'une réponse artistique? Oui, de ce que tu croyais avoir franchement. <laughs> ça dépend de la sensibilité des gens. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. It depends on the, you know, the, the nature or sensibility of, of people as, as well. And do you have a uh, yeah, comment, I mean, please? Is this working? Yeah. Yes. Uh, as performers, when, you, uh, when we uh, organize a frame which permits the audience to have a certain freedom in acting, because the, the performer is responsible of that, that frame, he is responsible of organizing a, a free structure, and if the person's not reacting according to your intention, that's kind of the fault of the performer, which has to accept it. Okay. So, I mean, if, if someone uh, would have changed your phrase yesterday, saying something else, you should go to grocery, and you should buy uh, tomatoes, you would have been, you would have been uh, forced to deal with that. Yeah. And that would have been your, your responsibility. And I think this is part of the difference between theater and performance. And this that is probability of... Mm -hmm. And if the head, uh, the clay head broke, and if there's many... Uh, it's, it's kind of a lottery, or... How to cope, or how to deal with those different uh, levels or apparatus. Concernant euh, la réponse des spectateurs, il ne faut jamais oublier que le spectateur a des attentes. Euh, le spectateur veut voir quelque chose, euh, refuse de considérer certains aspects. Donc, il, le, le spectateur a des désirs artistique. Donc, ça génère différentes, euh, différentes réponses à une proposition. Yeah, so often people will come, of course, with different um, desires of their own that they're projecting into their, into their, into the work and things that they will then take away from it that are quite different as well. Camille, do you have any? Yeah, which is like, I guess, a good segue into my work as well. Um, because, yeah, definitely, it, it, it's, I feel like, um, in, in particular with Liz Canadiana, it's, it's whatever people project onto the work is, is um, what they, they get out of it. But people don't always know I'm performing. And that's, that's the other thing about uh, mm -hmm. this work. So it's, 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 it's like a double frame in, in that way because, um, uh, and the, 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 the function of the accouchement, it's like, it's, it's uh, to um, signify something that um, people pick up on. And I'm always just amazed at how, you know, the simplest outer layer 
is what people read to understand something, you know? Um, I just remember going, when I first started doing this, I went to Regina to the RCMP headquarters um, with a, and they, of course, they don't know it's a performance, so I'm, I'm sitting there and I'm watching them do their thing, and um, I was there with a curator from a, a gallery who had commissioned the work, and at the end of the, but she, and she was dressed as a bodyguard. I had uh, bodyguards, I had a camera crew, a stretch limo, and I was there decked out. Um, after the performance, I went to thank the Mounties for their performance, <laughs> and I, um, I went to leave. And one of the senior officers came and said, well, could you stay for our graduation ceremony? <laughs> and the curator was just, so nervous at this point. She's like, we can't do this. We can't do this. We have to leave. <laughs> because, but I, I was just coolly, no, let's just do this. And, and we sat and we watched and it was fine. But, it was, <laughs> but it's so interesting to me just, you know, where that line is. Because there is a line. So where is that line that it crosses over into reality? Um, I just, I just find that the whole, um, and I, I mean, I didn't come in, I came into performance with this, with that particular work because, because it needed my body to do it. You know, I was, I came out of visual arts, but this particular piece needed my body to do it. And I'm just uh, constantly amazed at how um, people enter into that work and that relationship. I, I'm just constantly amazed at um, performance and, and learning a lot about the performances we do, the everyday performances. But, but I want to talk a little bit about the piece that I'm doing now. Because <laughs> yes. the sound piece, yeah. Because there is an absolute lack of any objects. It's all about, you know, our bodies, really. And um, it's 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 kind of it's like standing it's it's really stripping down everything and finding something deeper going inside. So it's it's and I guess this is the probably the first piece I've done like this that it's not about the objects. It's not about any of those outer things. It's about the inner. You know. So this is a, a completely new. Uh, it's, it, this is good because it's making me think about these things. <laughs> Sometimes things happen and you don't realize it until you start reflecting on it. So it's really interesting reflecting on this. <coughs> it's kind of you know, turning completely around and going in a different direction. But um, you know, it's, it's like the place where everything comes from is, is where we're going to go. <laughs> so <laughs> and so do you, I mean, I could go on forever about the everydayness of performing ourselves and yeah. identity and behavior and relationships and and all of those things and how they get you know called out to us as performance um, at certain moments when all of a sudden what we're doing isn't just doing but becomes visible to us or we're aware of it somehow as a performance or ritual in some way. Um, that said, I'm wondering if you. Um, yeah. Okay. Let me just throw this out, and then I'm. But but please, and if I don't see you, because I also have the light here, which makes we should have shadows to me more than faces. Please just stick up your hand, and we'll make sure that it might gets gets to you, because I'd really I'd really like to hear from you. I mean, so one of my questions to you, Camille, about about that, and feel free to respond as well, you two, is how much you're seeking, or in this particular work in the sonic walk, to um, bring, you know to bring audience into kind of complicity with you, to make them the performers, right? And, and in a way, to distribute the role of a performer across a larger number of, of people, rather than you know, holding on to that for, for yourself as spectacle or even non-spectacle. Yeah, I mean, in a, in a way, yeah, this, this kind of really, um, uh, conflates the roles, it, it, and the, the roles don't really mean anything anymore. 
I, 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 this is how I'm, I'm conceiving it anyway, uh, in this piece. Um, and it's interesting because performance can be defined as doing, but this isn't about doing, it's being, <laughs> you know? So it's, it's something completely different that I'm trying to get at in this piece. So it's, it's sort of, um, I don't know, I, I always wonder where are the edges, what, what constitutes performance, you know? But <laughs> yeah, I, it's a, my my area of research is performance and performativity theory stuff, right? And and I'm often saying to students in classes, I know y'all are really bored of hearing me talk about the definitions or lack thereof of performance, but weirdly enough, like in my field or on the academic side, people are still really invested in those questions and conversations. I mean, people have made careers on arguing about the finer points of you know, the being and the doing and the acting and the not acting and the natural versus the theatrical or like, what's the what, I don't, you know. So for me, like the, the being and the doing are closer together than the being and the acting, yeah. right? As a kind of differentiation, not necessarily of anything other than attitude yeah. to space or environment or spectacle, the real versus the constructed. Yeah. You had a... <laughs> Question or comment? <coughs> yeah, I would like to just to ask, like, uh, how important it is for you to give agency to the to the audience, actually, uh, not not in a way of interacting with them, but uh, in a way that you create a co-author work with them, in which you lose authorship, and the work becomes something that you cannot, even if you, if you can create a frame around it, you cannot really predict the result from it. How can you be open to that, or how interesting this can be for your own practice? Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I guess it depends on the work, you know, really. Um, it definitely depends on the work, because uh, like I say, the, 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 the work I do as, you know, in my Miss Canadiana piece or my Final Frontier piece, it's, it's kind of um, putting something out there and whatever comes back. But, Sometimes I'm, I'm shooting something and I am looking for certain things. It may not happen, but I am looking for certain things. So, yeah. I mean, the audience is what creates the work. To me, the, the, the audience is what creates the work, though, in, this, in, in those cases, in those kind of performances. Um, the audience completes the work because it's about it's about, um, I'm, I'm just trying to, I'm just trying, okay. I'm just trying to think of moments. <laughs> um, moments when that frame is broken. Moments when they realize that they're inside of a performance. Because I think those moments tell you something about what's going on, right? The nature of what, what's happening. And, and I, and I find those moments more interesting than sometimes the performance itself. Because then, um, then the audience really has agency. When, when they don't know it's a performance and they find themselves in it, then, then what happens next, I think, is um, something interesting. Um, I'll just tell a little story, and you, you may have heard it before, because I have told it before, but I was in Nova Scotia, for instance, in a place called, what is it called now? Nova Scotia. Um, <laughs> oh boy, what's it called? Oh, I can't think. It's um, a small town near, near outside of Halifax, and um, is a completely black town. Awesome. Sorry? East Preston or North Preston? North Preston, that's where it was. Thank you. My mind was just like not here for a second. <laughs> okay, so I was in North Preston. A lot of Canadians have no idea that this place exists. So it's North Preston, completely black town. Um, uh, there, was a, there were posters that were posted all over the, the, the town before I arrived. Um, I came. Um, on the hood of a car, parade around the town, <laughs> and and they knew that um, I was going to come to just to to the community center, and um, so everybody was invited to the community center, and 
So I was sitting there, places like this, everybody's sitting in the audience, and here I am dressed in full regalia, and I'm speaking. And they don't know it's a performance, but I'm speaking about the performance. And so when I come to that moment where I reveal that this is a performance, what happened next to me was really interesting. Someone said, you mean you made this up? <laughs> and I said, yeah, I shot the, the pageant in my backyard. And she said, you mean we could do this too? <laughs> that, seriously, honestly, that was the, for me, the best. The best, yeah, the best. yeah so, so for me, <laughs> Yeah, that, that, um, that ambivalence and that openness and that agency of audience is, is everything. But I, I mean, I love that take because it wasn't like you duped us, exactly. right? Exactly. Like, do you think we're stupid or something? Yeah. You know, the, the, it was exactly the opposite response, which exactly. is like fabulously agent exactly. and empowering. Yeah. yeah, we can yeah. do that. We can do any bloody old thing we want to, yeah. right? Yeah, and that was not the first time I've had re responses like that. That was just one of many, but that was the first time it happened and it was absolutely incredible. Yeah. Does, does people are, I get frustrated thinking that they're in the trick? I've never had that. I've never had that response. I think people see, as I have become aware after just from doing it, it, it it's, it's like it's bigger than me. It's not about me. It's, it's about something else, and, and so that's what I'm, I'm trying to, to communicate. And or are you aware that people could get frustrated? I didn't know what was going to happen when I crossed that line. It's like, okay, here comes the line. What's going to happen? I had no idea. It was, for me, like absolutely risking this kind of fracture, you know? But it, it, it opened up into something else, and so that's... That's what I, I wanted to... Do you know anything about the history of that town and why it's there? I mean, what you said is amazing in terms of the context of that town. Those people are, have been completely disenfranchised, completely disempowered, because that was the community that was um, expropriated when they built the second bridge in Halifax. They moved an entire black African community by force to the other side of the harbor and off into this really isolated community on some of the worst land in Nova Scotia. They have no access to jobs, nothing. And it's a very violent place. Yeah. So the fact that somebody said, you mean we can do that, yeah. just really strikes to the uh, heart yeah. of the whole I thing. I found so much love in that community. It was an incredible thing. I mean, people said to me, my god, you should have told us, you know, if they had understood what was going to happen. It's like, I should have had my daughters here. It was. So sometimes performance is much more than what it appears or what it, I mean, I didn't come to this with, with, with any of those, that knowledge, you know, when I came into this piece, it just came, it came to me and I started doing it and I learned um, about all kinds of things because of it. But, um, but, it, but it, it, to me, it's, it's like an incredible, powerful thing that I've tapped into that has nothing to do with me. I just happen to be that vehicle for this this thing to happen. So that's, I mean, so what do you think for you, for you, that performance gives you the opportunity to, to do or to test or to exercise that you wouldn't do otherwise? Espace, la, la performance nous, nous donne qu'on pourrait pas exercer dans une autre condition à travers la performance. C'est un super médium. Mais la, la question précédente de la salle, c'était. Yeah, I, just, yeah, so sorry, uh, Martin is just translating the previous question as well for, for, for Carl. So, yes, please go ahead while he's doing that. Um, I don't want to go on down a different road, but I, I just, um, this brings up to follow along this conversation about audience, agency, and um, I've thought a lot about sort of performativity and performance, and 
one thing that we can say about theater is that there's a safety, right? We have this sort of designated role as audience. We have the dark space, the expectation of passivity, and a certain kind of safety to our role as audience, even though there's a live, it's a live event, so we engage, you know, the, the actors or the performers in the theater respond to us, but there is a, a definite um, safety in being a spectator in theater. And uh, I think that what we're talking about here is sort of the, um, the wonderful thing that happens with, with an audience having agency. But it brings up for me a question of consent. And this is something I've talked a lot about with a good friend of mine in Vancouver who, who talks uh, writes about performance. And she, she has such a hard time with performance in general because she feels like she often does, nobody asks her for her consent to be a participant. And it, this comes, this is different, you know, performance to performance, but I am interested in the panelists, um, uh, con you know, uh, thoughts on this as well as the audience, because I know people might have strong feelings about this, but, but how do you, as a performer, um, sort of respect and take responsibility and think about this idea of consent with your, um, you know, your participants? That's just something I wanted to pose. That's a powerful question, I think, because it's, there's an, most often, you know, to the extent that we can talk about a contract that an artist has with an audience, it's an implicit one, right? There's an expectation that a person is willing or can extract themselves somehow otherwise, but we don't usually kind of sign away. And yet I think you're right in noting that very often the, the stakes for audience members are a great deal higher with many kinds of performance art. They're required to give of themselves and bring themselves and sometimes be very uncomfortable, potentially for a very long time, in ways that is not necessarily a requirement or expectation within more traditional theater structures. Does anyone have any thoughts? And again, I'd be happy to hear about this from the audience as well. I just want to add one thing to that, that thought, which is that I think a lot of performance art audiences are still attached to this idea of the theater audience. We still interact in that same way for, for the most part. We sort of, uh, it's really hard to break out of that role of passive audience. We sit down, we be quiet, we, you know, and, and um, I feel like this is one of those things like um, this gentleman said a minute ago that the, it's about the performer's responsibility to create that frame. And so it's, as our, it's our responsibility to create the frame for the audience members to res respond differently. Because the, the, the default is still, I think, a theater spectator. So we default to that, that's, that place. And, yeah. Uh, we're very polite, conventional spectators for the most part, I think, right? Mm -hmm. It's also really comfortable. We know what to do if that's the position we, we occupy. I think you're raising something really, really yeah, well, yes, relevant. The of the, of the space, no? because it's not just a safe. <coughs> it's not just a safe place, but it's a, a place of fiction as well. And because even if you see something, some piece that is addressed to political or social problems then you are s still seated and you're still going away then from this space where you saw the things happen. And with performance art, we try to operate in many contexts, different contexts. And of course, it comes with, like, for example, relational art from Nicolas Bourriot, in which like, you, you are really like, uh, affecting stuff and giving agency in, in the reality, in the real context, not in the fictional space. So probably has to do with the context and architecture <coughs> place that you cite. Can I, can I say something? Is this working? <laughs> I think it only has to do with, um, with, with the artwork and with, what, what the artist intends. Um, because um, like, what, it's a very big part of my work and I kind of set up, set up a space where um, people just don't know how to behave and where to stand. And, um, but some people, some artists just need a space where it's staged like, like in a theater. So people cannot just sit or stand and watch because it's more of a more of a show. I think it's a very artistic decision to take, like how you move people around the space, how you make them behave, how how much space you give them. Um, what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's just 
Yeah, sorry for my uh, yeah, I, I mean, nobody gave me their consent that I was born. I mean, I was, I was born without no. I didn't give my consent of being born. Uh, I don't give my consent of the war in Iraq. I don't give my consent to a lot of things that happens around me, like the poverty on the street or, you know. So I think that's something you have to deal with as a human being, just, you know, if you see a performance art on the street or if you see it in the, in the space. So it's, you know, Walk away or stay or intervene. I think that's you not. Know, that's but what sometimes we're not supposed to, you know. Like yesterday, you had performances when we're supposed to just when we're not when we're not supposed to walk around with disturb the artists, you know. No, of course not disturb. I mean, it really depends on the performance. Yeah, in the space. But I, I thought more about you know outside on the street because <coughs> that's where it happens. If you go into space, you you know that you expect something that is you know cold art which will happen. And uh, I mean, as an initi initiated audience, we had like, you know, some kind of uh, knowledge what's going to happen. But I think more about the, the street when you're in public space. Then you don't know what's going to happen. Then you, you know, but I think it's like, uh, like for instance, what we are doing in France is that we are imposing on, uh, the, old, on the public, you know, things that they say like, I don't want to see this, you know, and um, well, walk away with yeah. And, uh, you know, I think there's a potential flip side to wanting our audiences to really feel agency is that they may behave in ways not just that we didn't anticipate, but sometimes that we really don't want or that are disruptive to what our own intentions might, might be. And I think that's something that we need to make available as well if what we're interested in is, is really asserting or, you know, developing, engendering this kind of agency. Oh, I just wanted to talk about, uh, you know, if, if someone does m maybe have a, a bad reaction to it or feel uncomfortable, then isn't that kind of maybe the benefit of the, uh, the interaction, you know, that's what, because really what's expressed through, a, a pro through performance art, especially um, when I'm seeing the three up here and hearing them speak, is like, especially Camille speaking with such enthusiasm and it's just like obviously the women that 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 spoke to you were affected by your enthusiasm it was your intent they weren't offended because you weren't offensive you know so it's like what was expressed was your intent and it was a playfulness that she brought and it's something that is um, it's just it's just who you are so it's like you're you're making yourself present in that situation that you create, however you create it, whether it's just like your body, it's inside your body, or it's inside the room that you're standing in, it doesn't matter because it's you and you're there and you're choosing to be present in that situation. So you're sharing your intent with whoever witnesses it. Whoever chooses to witness it, that's the thing. If someone is reacting badly, then they're choosing not. It's something inside of them that's gonna lock it out regardless of what you bring to them. And like, I don't think that people really can be offended, regardless of what their preconceptions of what they want to see or what they read about it or even what you say it should be about. It doesn't matter, you know. And um, um, you two also talked about the sort of horrible um, butting of heads and this repetition of these deep expressions of like really intimate and sacred things that we're trying to express to each other through you know such a limited medium of words and uh, you add the playful element of making it the show and it's still in within that constant that context of danger but it's like your intent was also a playful one it's also because it's like everybody that's here right now all we want to do is like really be true with each other, you know? It's, that's what it feels like. It's just like we just want to express this, this truth of whatever human beings are. And it's just, uh, I don't know, I just don't, really don't care about anything else. <laughs> I, I just wanted to say that. <laughs> Your enthusiasm made me enthusiastic. <laughs> I find it so interesting with the, the Miss Canadiana piece, just the way the media responds. Because they don't always, I mean, for them, the story is, this is fake. 
So what is it, what's it like what's doing true? something that's so fake? <laughs> right? So the first time I was interviewed on CBC, they didn't even want to release the interview. For, for days they didn't release it because they're like, who does she think she is going around the country impersonating? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I, I think it's kind of interesting because, but, and, and you, to, yeah, you hit the nail on the head. It's, it's about the authenticity of that relationship that happens in real time with real people. You know, if I felt like I was being fake and putting this over on people, then I couldn't do it. Yeah, well, because yeah. everybody, or a lot of people ask me, like, or they think that I'm, oh, you're an actor, or you're, so yeah, you're acting, and exactly. I just feel like, honestly, I feel more like myself when I'm yes. performing than I do in my everyday life, and it, it's why, like, that's why I want to do it. Yes. It's almost like a practice. Everything is like an exercise or a practice, so that maybe I can do that more. And more for more of my life, not within the context of like a performance, but like to be that sort of a genuine individual, a person that connects with, actually connects with every other living thing, whatever that is. <laughs> uh, I just. Oh. It's okay. Uh, I just. Um, yesterday we were in a group talking about this. You know, relation with audience in the public space especially and um, Randy was giving an example of a performance that it took place I think here in, uh, in Toronto with the artist I mean we don't need to tell names or anything but uh, uh, we were talking about that sometimes artists are become a little bit naive when they come into certain contexts to um, try to save these contexts or, or trying to affect the context but then they are really bringing their own ideas of the place itself. Um, and then the work becomes a sort of appendix that's um, finished whenever the artist goes away for his, to his own country, for example. So I, I would like to know what you think about this uh, when you come into, when you make your audience like a public space and real people from a specific context or people that have a specific problematic on their daily lives or, I'm, I'm, I'm just, I wanted to share this with you and to th know what you think about it. Okay. So are you asking specifically about Miss Canadiana then? Uh, I know it. I, I, you haven't seen I've it? I haven't okay. seen the work, so I don't um, justice. Yeah, well, like I say, I, I came into this, this role um, from my own experience. I didn't think about any other experience. I thought about my experience. And I wanted to, to basically just express my experience. It was interesting to me when I started performing, because I was the first sort of, I mean, I've done other things, but this was like the first piece that just really sort of became something on its own. Um, I was really surprised to realize that it was not just about my experience. There is more. And it's it's an entry point for all kinds of people. People see what they want to see. They see a reflection of themselves. They see what they bring to it. They see, you know, all the the baggage that they bring. They they see all they, they see different things when they look at, at my image, you know? So uh, so yeah, I, I, I don't come into a context to fix things or to create things or to make things. I just come and whatever happens, happens. I don't have an agenda, you know? It's really amazing to me when things happen and like I don't, I cannot predict because I sometimes, you know, I didn't know, I didn't realize in a lot of cases what the context is, you know? so. Um, but that's that piece. There are other works, like for instance, I did another piece called The Final Frontier, and it, um, it's a group of uh, African astronauts who, are, <laughs> who left Earth 10,000 years ago. They're descendants of the Dogon people of West Africa. They left Earth 10,000 years ago, and they came back to save the planet. <laughs> And so they land in Lethbridge, Alberta. <laughs> now, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I've taken it to different places, but Lethbridge is where it started. And it started, again, because of my own experience there. You know? 
So I don't know that I came to fix the world or anything like that, but I, and I, I did come to reflect my experience. But in that case, I did research all the things that happened in Lethbridge. So I knew what that context was. And I don't know that I had expectations. I came to do, but what happened was this, again, like something else took over. It's, it was this, this, this unexpected um, connection with people that I could not have anticipated. Like when we, you know, and this piece was not just me, it was four of us, you know, walking across the prairies with these bowls of grain and <laughs> basically sharing this grain with people. And the, the, the response, the, and we don't, we don't speak, so they don't know who we are, they don't know what our agenda is, nothing, nothing you know? So they're putting their own agenda on, on us. And it was so interesting, just, you know, I, I, we had no idea, but that, it was very, um, it, was, it was just so touching, it was just, like, just, th there was this real communication that, that happened between people. So even knowing that context, coming in and, and understanding that, I still cannot predict what was gonna uh, transpire and something very special transpired between the people that, I, you know, that we encountered. You know, they started taking the grain and sharing it amongst themselves. So it was quite a beautiful moment, but who knew, <laughs> you know? Maybe yeah. something to be drunk about your question that you've, uh, uh, that you've, uh, that you've said that an artist working uh, could be working with the context or on the context. The artist responding mm -hmm. to the context and working with it, like uh, like you do, you, 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 you work with the context with the people, and, or the difference that working on with uh, with an idea already done on that context. So you land there, you do your thing. You know, and go what is the difference between the context and on the context? Uh, it could be a question that, that could be developed, but if you work with the context, it means it's more inclusive, and working on is more exclusive. So you, you, you're there with already your ideas on that context. But if you work on the context, so you do the same work in each context, it doesn't matter. So. It, yeah, it could, or, or you can be really specific to a cause or something, or a, a social, uh, social uh, Question social, social question that, that that could be present at that place specific, but you you're you're kind of excluding. I guess you work specifically on something. Or here's you don't let things affect your work. Like if you're working with, then if you're working on. Uh, well, I mean, I would ask. As if <laughs> the question addressed specifically the public spaces. Uh, I think the work we've done was only in artistic context, so the context with which we are working is with uh, on performance or with their performance, so addressing uh, limits or uh, a priori of that milieu, most of involving communities and yeah and yet also i think that you know a kind of social or cultural context yeah. that understands conversation about relationships and particularly about queer relationships mm -hmm. and what it would mean to, to present those things so i think you know even when we imagine um something that's not context specific in terms of political or social commentary there's a lot of that backdrop that still functions as a an assumed or you know, assumed common context, right? So in your environment that's happening within art spaces or structures, there's, you know, you're devising your work mm -hmm. for an audience that's familiar with that somehow, mm -hmm. right? And yet in other places, that's not necessarily the case. If you did that work somewhere else, then mm -hmm. there would be, I think, other facets of the conversation about relationship and change and locked mm -hmm. together qualities that would maybe produce very different sorts of results. Yeah. There was a, we have a question. Yeah. Oh 
I feel like it's a little bit belated now. It was it was a long. That's um, that's okay. Resurrected. I I actually I had a comment around agency and consent. It's uh, something that's really important to me, and I drink a lot of coffee, and I'm feeling really good. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I specifically within the context of 7-11D, we have quite a lot of documentation. Um, mediatized documentation. And I don't consent to being documented, but I don't feel that there's space for that. And, and that there's space to refuse? Yeah, right. and, and as well, it, it can be problematic, like in terms of um, documenting someone's performance, if I'm sitting near it, it's difficult. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to be an asshole, you know? Um, but I also have no control over what happens to that documentation, and and have had really negative things happen out of that. Um, so just in terms of our, of our discussion around consent and agency, I think that that's a really relevant thing and I think um, within your particular performances, it's interesting to me, I feel that those who, who translated or uh, fed you the lines, in a way stepped over a line and offered consent to be documented quite, quite clearly. You know, physically move the geography of the space, cause that. Um, but it's interesting, Camille, to me in your piece, when you talk about the audience response as being a quite, it seems for you, integral to what the performance is. And so, specifically within the context where an audience is maybe an unknowing audience, if you can say that, where they're unaware of the, the uh, that you're in a persona, mm -hmm. Um, I, I wonder if you had thoughts around consent, around documentation of those folks, if you guys have ever experienced issues around that. And also, I really just want to make that comment, so if no one has anything to say, that's totally okay as well. Thank you. Yeah, well, it's, I think that's an important thing to talk about, and it's something I've been grappling with in my work. Um, Obviously, when I'm Miss Canadiana, people see the cameras. They know that if they don't want to be in the camera, they don't come anywhere close to me. So that's one thing. But the other thing is, um, if I want to use this, this document um, for my own purposes, um, like when I first started, it was all very guerrilla style. It's become more and more, not staged, but I have, like, I, I hire people to document now. And so I've been getting people to sign consent forms. So it's, it's this, this whole thing now about, you know, when you start doing that, then it changes it the changes work. It changes the work a lot. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and I just remember too, when we were in Lethbridge and we're shooting The Final Frontier, you know, I was with a camera crew that I didn't know. It wasn't the, the people that I work with here, it was people there that we hired and I didn't know them and they were afraid to cross each other's sight lines to get the really intimate things that were, were going on. So a lot of stuff that happened was not documented. And a lot of things you can't capture anyway. But that, that idea of coming in and sort of invading that space and, and, and you know, um, invading the intimacy that was going on, um, yeah, yeah it's, it's something I grapple with. And we're, as a, maybe it's another, question that, that I'm answering, I don't know. But um, one of the people that I worked with for Final Frontier is a filmmaker. And so he had very different ideas about you know what shots we needed in order to cut this into a film, right? But for me, it's about the performance, and that's for, first and for, foremost. Like, what is going on? It's, like, it has to unfold, and it's, it can't be constrained by you know all these camera angles, and this and that, and all that, you know? So it is something I grapple with, it is, and, and, and it does change it if I ask for permission, especially if I ask for permission before, then you cannot, then something spontaneous won't happen and it kind of shuts down the performance, you know? Um. de la notion de consentement et celle de l'espace de liberté de création pour les participants et les participants. 
euh, une question notamment à, à, à la, la documentation de notre travail et la diffusion de ça par rapport aux gens qui ont participé, à quel point on considère euh, qu'ils ont été s'ils sont pour auteur et si euh, euh, leur, leur accord est, est, va être demandé, comment on, après ça on se sent libre ou on, on sent qu'on est une, 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 responsabilité. une responsabilité, une éthique par rapport à, à ça. Tu réponds Oui. Tu réponds I think it happened only once in Cardiff. Someone who helped us was part of the project, and we had uh, to we 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 asked her if uh, she would let us show and uh, the this picture because I think we could say that always our work is very uh, framed. This is the yeah. And uh, so we asked. And she said no? No, so she said, said yes. And we have a photo also if she had exposed. Because my mother said it's the only. Yeah. And just before, we also give uh, in the audience snapshot, uh, disposable snapshot, right. yeah. to have many views of the performance. I think 50 different snapshots. Concernant la responsabilité des documents, mm -hmm. euh, <coughs> si c'est uniquement des documents de travail, puis ce n'est pas diffusé ou exposé, on ne demanderait pas l'autorisation. Mm -hmm. Lorsqu'il y a des participants, parce que dans nos photographies, il y a aussi des participants, il y a toujours à ce moment-là un consentement, puis joue un. Les, les personnes jouent un rôle officiel dans mm -hmm. Mais sinon, des documents de travail. Ben là. So when they are participants, as they are part of the project, we need a release to be uh, shown in our documentation. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Thoughts or comments? I think we're drawing near to the end of our time in a structured way, anyhow, for this afternoon. But I'd be happy to entertain additional comments or questions or thoughts from any of you before we encourage people to eat more pie and <laughs> wraps. There's one uh, last question that I would have. It's sort of what we've been dancing around a lot all day around this idea of getting an audience to really participate. I mean, I think it's really interesting what Camille was saying about they're performing more than me, or it feels like that. In a way, people are able to perform because they don't realize it's a performance. But in the gallery context, in the kind of art context in which Caroline Martin said they usually situate their work, um, I think it's much more difficult for audiences to get beyond that what we were talking about, this sense of politeness, the sense of, of a very rigid understanding of what the role of the audience is. And often I have impulses to do things and I just cut them because I'm not the performer. But as a performer, I know often I'm just wishing somebody would take up that impulse and, and, that, and understand that for me it's only a frame and it's not really about me being the performer. And I know even in your artist statement, you talk a lot about making the audience aware of their role and, and perhaps um, uh, involving them or finding themselves implicated in a different way than, than the normal audience role of, of theater. So I'm just wondering if you had any comments about that and how you, how you get beyond this, this uh, because it's, you know, it was suggested it's the audience, it's the, it's the artist's responsibility if they didn't create the right frame if, if the audience doesn't do what they want or expect or, but I think that it's tricky, it's really tricky to try to get an audience to, to, to just say to them, you can actually do what you want here, even though it's supposed to be a performance, 
please do what you actually want to do, I think that's a very, very difficult thing to actually find a way to express or find a way to, to uh, engage the audience with. So I'm just wondering if you had any comments about that. compris, c'est comment prédisposer le public à ce qu'ils exercent leur espace de liberté, euh, comment organiser, prévoir ou attribuer cette... Je dirais qu'il y a un problème, euh, il y a un problème euh, peut-être avec différentes formes d'art, c'est que ça, ça débute aussi des fois avec un programme, telle journée, à telle heure, les gens s'assoient, Ils ont la gentillesse d'applaudir à la fin, même si c'était épouvantable ce qu'on avait fait et euh, épouvantable de contenu. Il y a un bravo, un merci. Euh, donc il y a des codes. Euh, C'est très difficile de, de, de les briser ou de les réinventer. Donc on doit travailler avec puis essayer de déplacer, mais pas changer le monde. <rire> non, on ne changera pas le monde là. Donc, on, on essaie de, des déplacements, faire vivre quelque chose d'un peu à côté de ce qui était attendu. Mais sinon, on fait ça sur le toit de l'hôtel à minuit, on n'avertit personne, puis on rigole. Mais ça, ça commence avant le... le... You want me to translate it? <laughs> If you like. So, <laughs> sure, I can. You say that it's a big challenge because uh, while uh, well before the work, there is a program, a schedule, and uh, also uh, yes, a, 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 a and a structure. And um, to, to work. But of course, it was also funny because you said, well, you know, you can't change the world with all these things. But the title of the performance mm -hmm. last night was Changing the World, right? <laughs> so this sense of conditioning the, the structure mm -hmm. and the response, mais, I think, is... Mais en connaissant ces codes, le, le fait qu'on les connaît... We know these codes. Euh, on a créé une performance qui est un spectacle avec des rideaux de, mm -hmm. de se donner en, spe en spectacle. Mm -hmm. Mais comme des chicanes de couple dans les restaurants qui donnent des mauvais spectacles de de scène de ménage. Ouais. C'est jouer euh, authentique, mais jouer avec un, un public qu'on on sait comment ils vont réagir. It's an utopian view of, of just getting rid of all of this and, and being completely free. If it's free, there is no performance. Well, and you know, I think it, it bears thinking about whether what we want is complete freedom from those strictures. I mean, one of the things that uh, Carl was saying is that you know we do certain things within the kind of frame of performance in a mm -hmm. space like this, rather than the way we would behave, you know, and move in a restaurant context and what, what that would mean, how that would be perceived um, as a kind of show or, or spectacle. But I, I don't know. I mean, my impression is that um, even as these questions are coming, they're not necessarily seeking a complete dissolution of the space, you know, between something that is the normal everyday behavior and something that is called out from that. You know, it strikes me that the, this kind of calling attention that we were talking about earlier is very much what, you know, what these artists have been using performance to do, to, to separate something even as it functions occasionally, um, not so much as seamless, but maybe as imperceptible, imperceptibly different from the everyday. Because performance and that faculty to, to, uh, to underline behaviors and that, that's something that is, for myself, this specific performance that uh, you're coming to give yours. But also just to make sure all of the comments are translated, I thought that the distinction between déplacé and changer le monde is, is important. This yeah. idea that we can displace or destabilize a little bit the context, not necessarily Absolutely. change the whole world. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Absolutely, and thank you for bringing that in, because I think that, that destabilization, right, the making uncomfortable is really, is really what sort of... <laughs> 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 
<laughs> We're making on in any one performance. Let's do it. <laughs> Maybe I should just keep performing and that's what does it. Um, also, I think uh, when we're talking about performance art, often what we're talking about is a form that came out of the visual arts. So, so we think about photographs and we think about video documentation, but maybe we also need to challenge ourselves to think about other forms of the document. And if what you're really looking for as a performer are authentic moments between people, there's always you know, a closed space where you're not asking somebody to come leap out of the out of the, uh, the audience position and be an, have an authentic moment in front of a whole room of other people where you can have a closed space authentic moment and then, do and then journal afterwards, write about it. Find other forms of documentation that, that isn't happen. linked to, sorry? That does happen. Uh, no, I know it does oh, okay. happen, of course. Of course, there's lots of people who are working in these ways. Um, but I just think that some of those questions around, you know, around, um, consent and documentation, there are other forms, like it does happen, there are other forms to have. And, I, and of course, I'm not, I'm not being, I'm just being a little bit, you know, um, maybe aggressive in my life. <laughs> but yeah, of course, there are, there, are, there are authentic moments that happen in front of a room of people, for sure. But I just, I think that it's, that there are many, many ways to, to work with a document and it might not always be a video. Thank you. We do have another comment in the front, and then I think it's going to be our final uh, yeah, it's just a comment on what you were saying about um, audiences uh, are interacting or being passive. But I was thinking a lot about la the last performance that happened last night with the hula hoop. And then at a certain point, the hula hoop started to hit the audience. It's like the artist was either just letting go of it, losing control, and just throwing it at them. But I thought to me it was just so strange the way the audience interacted. They were just kind of like, ah. Like just allowing the artist to hit them with it. And it wasn't just once, it was like it happened multiple times. And then it wasn't until the end that one audience member tried to like tug at the hula hoop, like didn't want to give it back. And then that was just a split second and kind of went back to it. But it just seems like such a passive audience to just be like, okay, you can hit us, like we'll go with it. <laughs> there was also the the, um, the the announcement before that performance was uh, the artist asks the audience to please stay for the endurance of the work to not leave the room, which I thought was quite something to have that you know there is going to be a fog machine, so if that's going to be a problem for you, please you know be acknowledging of that. But they didn't say you might also get hit in the head by hula hoop, but they just said please stay for the duration of the work. And so there was that was this pretty specific request that kind of incites like, and if you get hit in the head, of a little bit. Well, Stay. Well, they had a structure, right? People were placed and seated and organized, and you know, so I think it was constructing this a, a kind of compliance. You know, you do this, and this is the space where stuff's going to happen, and you can't encroach on it. Therefore, you're not, you know, participants, or you're not part of the performer access in that in that way. So I think it did structure. You know, a very particular kind of environment for for behavior, which is an interesting one, both when it was breached and when it wasn't. Yeah. So obviously we have lots of these issues to continue talking about in lots of different contexts and with regard to a whole bunch of different performances, which is, is frankly the point. So with that said, I'd like to thank all of you very much for having been here. I'd like to thank